everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and I'm going to tell you why I don't pray. Coming up next. All right, so, hey, good morning, good morning. I hope you're doing well. I've got my sponsor, coffee. But, um, yeah, no, uh, I don't get paid by coffee. I just, I actually have to pay coffee. So I'm a husband and a father. I'm a pastor of a small church here in Kentucky. And I seek to use this medium to be against the world, but for the world. So in this world, we will have trouble, Jesus promised, but fear not, I have overcome the world. And so doing that means different things. Well, contramundum is an old, old kind of thought. It's kind of, you know, it's not all over, but you probably have heard it here and there. Uh, of course, contra means, you know, contrary, where we get contrary, contradiction, things like that. Something opposite, something pushing against. Um, contramundum is against the world, but pro mundo, I kind of add, and, and that means to be for it, right? So somebody was against me, somebody was against you if you're a follower of Christ. And praise God for that, right? They said, your worldview is not good by itself. You're living in sin. You're broken. You're messed up. That's that hole, you know, the whole Godship hole in your heart. However, the evangelism worked or, you know, from a pastor or your parents or, you know, somebody at college or something like that. And those things matter. That's, that's how this works. You got changed, right? The spirit of God changed you uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus. So, somebody was against you. I'm against things, whether it's church stuff or whether it's uh, something like this, prayer. Now, I'm, of course, you know, it's not too clickbaity, but I don't pray to the saints. I don't pray to Mary. Now, I'm a confessional Baptist, and, you know, that just means I believe in the autonomy of the local church and believers' baptism uh, mainly, and, of course, just the centrality of the scripture. Now I'm in a Southern Baptist church. I don't. I hold the Southern Baptist Convention very loosely uh, because there's a lot of problems, and I do a lot of videos on that. Uh, if you're curious about that, not a ton, but some. And yeah, but there's plenty of people. I was in a conversation yesterday uh, with somebody on a chat. It was a live conversation or question and answer, and this person had a little graphic as maybe 15, 15, 14th century art of you know some saints, and. So why, why don't so-called Christians pray to the saints? Why don't they pray to Mary? Why don't they observe the Eucharist or obey the Eucharist? This sort of thing. It was, it was a little unusual. So I had to engage with this person. It wasn't my Q&A. It was something else. You didn't miss anything. But, um, or you didn't miss anything because I didn't do it. You might have been there because uh, I know there's a lot of overlap. This is a, a friend uh, who has Edwin <clears throat> proverbial life. Anyway. So I was in there and I said, okay, well, give me some examples. Where is this? Where should we pray to Mary? Where should we do this and this? Can't, can't give any, but let's, let's just, let's just try to give the benefit of the doubt and at least look at prayer. Now, Paul and Barnabas are at Lystra in Acts 14, 11, and Paul does a miracle and the people believe in Paul, quote unquote. They start worshiping him. Now I understand Roman Catholics, Orthodox, ah, oh, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Okay, fine. But these are people observing, worshiping people. Well, we're venerating. Well, there, this is really semantics at this point. 2 Chronicles 6.21 Hear the supplica supplica supplications of your servant and your people Israel. And they pray in this place. Hear from heaven. 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people, popular verse, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. Ephesians 6.18 And pray in the Spirit, in the Spirit, on all occasions, for all kinds of prayers and requests. <clears throat> With this in mind, be alert always, keeping, keep on praying for all the Lord's people. But, also, Matthew 5.44 But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, we're praying for our church, the the people who love Jesus, and we'll pray for our enemies. That is against what the world says. The world says, kick them in the teeth, smash them, put your foot on their neck. It doesn't matter. There is no grace, no forgiveness in the world. And we've seen this, and we see this with the woke nonsense, uh, all the leftism and all the tyranny that has been going on off and on throughout the world over the last couple of years. In particular, the last couple of years, it's been happening for centuries, but it's very heightened at this 
moment in history. John uh, 1715, my prayer is that not you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. This is Jesus praying to God, the Father. So, you know, modalism's out. Jesus isn't formally the Father and then becoming the Spirit. This is what Marcus Rogers, T.D. Jakes, uh, several others, um, the Tatum guy, Brandon Tatum, supposedly believe. There's this kind of oneness, uh, God, God. It's just, there's only one God, which there is one God. But they ignore the fact that God is three persons. They ignore the fact that God is three persons. It's a difference. Um, this isn't about the Trinity, but it's all over. And it makes the Bible very strange very quickly if you don't know there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Or you don't believe that. Psalm 17.6, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, right? This is one of the verses, especially us Bible people, uh, you know, it's so hard, I can't pray without ceasing. It's an attitude of prayer. So don't beat yourself up. I can't, how can I pray without ceasing? So I won't do it at all. <laughs> this is what uh, my wife used to struggle with a lot. Um, that's common knowledge. She's not like, not spilling anything she wouldn't tell you. Um, but many people do. Well, how, how can I pray? If I can't pray all the time, then forget it. I'm not going to pray at all. That's exactly where the enemy wants. I also think he wants us to pray to the ceiling, a.k.a. the saints. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What is God's will for you? To give thanks in everything. So give thanks today. And also, I would be thankful if you take a moment, like this video, drop a little comment. It's a three-piece special, my buddy calls it. Comment, like, and share. And if you haven't subbed, please sub. Consider subbing. Uh, it has helped. It does help me out. Thank you, those. I've got a number of subs over the weekend. Uh, I went from, it was like two-something to three, five, three or five, three or three, or three something like that. So anyway, thanks for coming on. Uh, I appreciate it. It's, it's it's an encouragement, and I love it. And it's building a community. I've built a lot of friends, and uh, and friendships. So there's so many more, but we don't. Secondly, so first of all, B part the B part A is we don't need to because we're not commanded to, and there's no example number two of doing this at all. Praying to the saints, praying to Mary, none, none, none. That's why I don't pray to Mary. Pray to the saints. Now I understand Roman Catholics do this and Orthodox do this, but I urge you. Stick with the scripture. I don't care what the Pope says or what your bishop says or what some writing from 400 years ago says. Too many people do this. And now I understand we have a corpus. We've got the 1689 Baptist Confession. Uh, there's the Westminster. There's the Nicene Creed. Of course, we've got the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That's the year, right? 2000. Um, many, many other confessions. Lutherans have it. Methodists have it. Uh, Presbyterians and so on. Some are, oh, I just need the Bible. Well, I get it, and we do just need the Bible. But having confessions of faith and other things that we adhere to is also good, because when we just have the Bible, sometimes people still go off the rails. I'm not saying these things are foolproof, but they are guardrails. So, part B, we don't need to, right? We don't need to pray to Mary. Not only are we not commanded to, or we don't see any examples, but we don't need to pray to the saints or to Mary. Plus, everybody's a saint. Right? You can look look up the word saint and realize that it's just talking about Christ followers. Okay, There is no distinction, but this is so Roman Catholic, and even the world is still saturated in this. Oh, you're a saint. Oh, you're just so pious. I've got the little thing. and the, the, and I'm gonna, No. No, not at all. It's not. You don't need it. We don't need to pray to the saints, and there aren't actual saints. I'm a saint. My wife's a saint. If you're a follower of Christ, you're a saint. And not because of yourself, not because you achieve some sort of sainthood, because some pope a while back was like, duh, you know, did a little dance and a little smells and bells. No. Rather, because you're a Christian. You're a follower of Christ. ESV, but as, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted by a better promise. Hebrews 8, 6. So right there, Jesus is better. Hebrews, please go read Hebrews. And it's so, there's so many parallels. And if you're like, ah, oh, dude, you're, you're, uh, oh, no, I don't, I disagree. Go read Hebrews, please, before 
before you comment, I mean, you can comment if you want to, but go read Hebrews. Because as a Protestant, as a Christian, as a, as a, as a Bible believer, whatever you want to call it, the goal is, is the Bible, right? That's, and not worshiping the Bible, but worshiping the author behind the Bible. Because the Bible is inerrant and infallible, we, it has everything pertaining to life and godliness. It doesn't have, there isn't extra things, ex cathedra, right? That's the, the Pope or, or, or all these extra writings putting in the corpus of tradition. Now, I understand we, I've got books right here. I've got Tom's commentaries, right? I like authors and bios and all sorts of other stuff. But <clears throat> we need to understand that those things pale. Whereas Roman Catholics in particular, it's, it's Bible and tradition right next to each other. Well, that's what the Mormons do. And oftentimes, the tradition, you know, the Book of Mormon and so on, go above. Now, Mormons are not Christians at all. Um, and I know there's still... I believe there can be and probably are certain Roman Catholics and even Orthodox uh, are certainly lovers of Christ. But you're being highly inconsistent by doing something like this. Because it's borderline idolatry. Um, or you're just being confused or whatever. So I urge you, if you're somebody who does not adhere to the Bible only, as the supreme, right, this is tradition, as the Bible being up here and everything else down here, and you pray to the saints, you pray to Mary, you don't need to, right, because not only, not only you're not commanded to, or you see zero examples, this person I asked them multiple times could not even give one at verse, not even hinting at verse, you know, skirted the question in a typical politician type way. Hebrews 12, 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and sprinkled to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not receive, refuse him who speaks. For if the people did not escape when they refused him when he warned on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? Hebrews 12, 24. Again, that's not talking about prayer explicitly. It's talking about Jesus. It's talking about Jesus being the incarnate God, the great high priest, the one who, as I read now, Hebrews 4, since then we have a great high priest. Right? So it goes through several chapters. You know, we therefore, since then, we see these kind of transitional points. Since then, this is so good. I love this passage. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, in case you're curious who this is, it's not a pope, it's not a man, it's not a woman, it's not some, you know, whatever, some person who achieves sainthood. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I'm all for confessions. Right, but the confession is that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does Peter say? Who, who am I? Some say I'm the prophet, I'm this, Elijah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Remember, because there's, there's, there are dead gods, right? There's either machinations and imaginations of people's ideas or demonic powers. Just, there, are, there are gods, quote unquote. Now, there isn't like, you know, Zeus and all these other baby gods. That's what I'm saying. Uh, although I believe Zeus and all those other baby gods were, in fact, probably some sort of demonic um, manifestation because they're not idiots, right? These are ancient wisdom people. They weren't, they weren't fools. And we could see these people worshiping Paul and Barnabas, right, at Lystra. They've probably seen some sort of spiritual entity come to life. And then we see angels doing this with Abraham and Lot, right, manifesting. We're told even in the Bible other places, now I'm derailing, but it's important, um, that we've un entertained angels unawares, right? Angels come in, sometimes in physical body. We see these two men standing there in Acts 1. Many people think it's angels. Some people think it's maybe Elijah and Moses even. But it just says men. Now angels, spiritual entities in, in particular, start or show up always as men. But it doesn't say anything about wings and halos and all the other nonsense hallmark Hollywood junk. That's not true. Anyway, that's where we kind of get seraphim and we mix it all together and, you know, get some mod podge of stuff. Number page, uh, page, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Oh, I love this. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let that sink in. If you don't know Christ today, you have a high priest 
who can and does sympathize. But you have to repent. You have to surrender. You're not your Lord. He is. He is the Lord. Turn to Christ. Repent and believe in the gospel. His life, his death, his resurrection. That is the eternal life. Not the woke nonsense. Not some sort of works-based theology. Not, oh, Jesus is a moral teacher and I just got to be good. Not any sort of anything. Not antinomian where law doesn't matter. God doesn't care about my actions. I can live, have sex with whoever, do whatever, drink whatever, eat whatever, go wherever. No. Jesus is Lord. But you must acknowledge that he's Lord and you must surrender and repent and believe in his work, his life, his death and his resurrection. Verse 16, and we'll wrap up with this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. We don't have a good view of God and haven't for really a long time, honestly, probably ever. <laughs> um, it's gotten better over the years in, in certain places, but it's dipped back down. We have a very low view of God. And just like the seesaw teeter-totter, when we're up here, God's down here. Just flat out. This needs to do this. Not that we're worms, although some people have that theology. I disagree. We are made in God's image, but we're not gods. We're not many gods. Sorry, Joyce Meyer. Sorry, this person, these, you know, teachers, quote unquote. We're not little gods. We're not divine entities, Mormonism, oh, we're going to achieve godhood. No, 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 no. It's nonsense. It's heresy. Rather, we worship God. And because of who we are in him, that's what gives us value. That's what gives us our worth. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The throne of grace. We can approach God, the creator, who's holy, set apart. That's what that means. Ultimately, holy is set apart, distinct, different. We are in this chasm. We, there's this massive, just hole in the ground difference. Abraham, right? The rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. There's a chasm fixed. The rich man's over here in torment. That we may receive mercy and to find grace and help in time of need. If you need need, if you have a need, which you do, let's be real here. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody needs something. And it's not just get to Jesus for that need, but rather to embrace how you are actually created. You are a worshiper. You do worship something, whether it's God or something else. So I hope you found this helpful. Again, like I said, uh, if you did, give me that three-piece special. I appreciate it. Um, and until next time, we're going to look at some uh, First Baptist Orlando stuff. Silliness there on Friday. So look for that. Um, and I'm doing a Q&A tomorrow with uh, Gary DeMar. He is a uh, theologian, author, speaker on end times, Christian worldview. And he's going to be answering your questions about the end times. So come here one o'clock live, one o'clock live central time on Thursday. And if you are watching this after that, just go watch that. And it'll be in somewhere. Anyway, take care. Be contramundum pro-undo. See ya.